Um, so our title of our presentation is quite a mouthful. It is, uh, oh, you know what? Let's see, program program management tools for a diverse and inclusive campus work environment. And the case study will be our office, which is the Disability Access and Compliance Office here at Berkeley. Great. Um, so uh, moving on. Uh, wow, this is going swimmingly. So um, one of the critical roles of our office is to, to actively seek and promote an inclusive workplace. We want to celebrate and in, embrace our diverse backgrounds, preferences, and needs. We're a small team with different officers who are working in really fundamentally different program areas. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what our individual needs are as an office and how that plays into our uh, project and program management. Um, but what we're doing here is demonstrating how we focus on workplace culture, which is enabling us to maintain community among team members in digital spaces, hybrid spaces. Um, and it really requires that we recognize and support each other during life events that we trust in, in our, each other's work ethic and work product. And I think that it's really important um, when you can understand that life events will happen regardless of you know, whether you separate work um, where, you, where you have the ethos of separating work from, from life, um, it, you know, I think that we as a, as an office is really, is really understanding just from the nature of our work that life events happen and we really have to support each other through those, through those times. And, you know, it could be anywhere from needing to uh, address a family matter and needing to stay there and needing to work remote from there. Um, I think that having this really flexible work environment has really enabled us to maximize um, our output as a as an office. Yep. So um, just a quick introduction to our team. Um, um, there are a total of six professional staff in our team. Um, Ella Callow is our director. Um, she's the ADA compliance officer for the campus. Um, I'm Ben Prez. I manage physical and architectural accessibility for the campus. Uh, and I'm Thea Chun. So I am working with a new project uh, involving digital accessibility. And then Derek, did you want to introduce yourself? We'll go ahead and introduce Derek. <laughs> well, Derek, are you off? Uh, oh, is the audio off? Oh, that's okay. Sorry, Derek, your audio is off, so we'll go ahead and introduce you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, Derek Coates is our manager of program access. He works um, across all of the uh, you know out, uh, all of well, all of the university programs to ensure accessibility um, um, with uh, the way that we uh, manage people and information. Hi, can uh, you hear me now? Hey, there we go. Yeah, you guys have me muted. I couldn't unmute. Okay. So I think Zoom muted me, so I'm clicking the button. It's not working. <laughs> okay, my name is Derek Coates. I'm the manager of program access in the Office of Disability Access and Compliance, and I handle all of the program services and activities access for the campus. Ben? Yep. So in addition, we have Steve Johnson. He's a policy complaint and special projects manager. So when we have disability discrimination complaints, as well as deep work with a specific group on campus that needs to make adjustment in order to assure access, uh, equal access and Donna Lee, who's the executive assistant, supporting our office across all of these program areas. Um, I think the thing to note is that each of the people in our team works in highly specialized program areas that differ quite greatly from each other. Um, so although we're all working together as one team, there is an incredible amount of diversity in what our work product is. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, this will work. Uh, so um, I'll just read off of the screen for um, folks who need that. Um, so where, as uh, Ben said, we have a diverse array of work output, um, which is partly why we had to really uh, review and find some sort of project management tool that would work across our office. So um, for example, we uh, our functional and access needs um, for the team include documents that need to be access 
accessible to screen readers, um, having asynchronous uh, schedules. Um, since some of us, uh, sometimes uh, we, we have a staff member who deals with uh, chronic pain. And so sometimes depending on the day, she'll have to um, modify her work schedule to outside uh, regular office hours, for example. Um, and, uh, and again, having a hybrid sort of flexible work environment has enabled us to um, kind of really uh, stay cohesive as a unit. Um, yep, yeah. so um, some of the work product that our team delivers include presentations, trainings, uh, publications. We also do uh, you know, consultations with individual stakeholders across campus, including one-on-one -on -one consultations for people, for example, for emergency preparedness for disabled com campus community members. Um, there's a lot of inter interdisciplinary work where we're moving between different units across campus. Um, we're coordinating with different departments um, up and down the org chart. Um, uh, we have to address grievances as they come up, and that requires uh, you know, a different type of uh, uh, response uh, timeframe, and then implementation of digital accessibility policies. So this is just to highlight again that the work that is coming out of the office, uh, although we are again one team, it, it covers a, a whole range of uh, of different um, uh, you know of different of different outputs. Um, so. Again, we work uh, developing policies that steer high-level decision making. We're working with event sponsors to ensure accessibility uh, at uh, for guests and visitors. Reviewing software platforms and compliance for uh, in compliance with the uh, the, ITAC. the yeah, it's the information technology accessibility uh, policy, which is across the UC system. And so the policy is that we as the whole UC system, um, it's a UCOP policy where we strive to make sure that the digital environment is accessible and um, to and each campus uh, polices themselves. Each campus creates their own procedure and policies um, and we're currently in the process of updating our policies um, and uh, our procedures for that. Great. And so again, we, we've output master plans and maps, websites, workshops, and work plans, customer service and support. Okay, so again, uh, just based on our actual team, diversity is inherent in the, how our team works. So again, uh, hybrid schedules, uh, work locations differing across the team. We have uh, fully remote in-person and hybrid uh, staff members. We're using technology where we can and flexibility where we need to in order to address the access and functional needs of our teams, screen readers, as an example, flexible deadlines, focusing on our key priorities as opposed to any individual set of deadlines that approach. And this flexibility, I think, is really important because when you're working in a team that has so many different moving targets, different needs, and high-level work that has to be done, it's very frequent that we need to make adjustments to what looks like a set schedule in order to address our high priority, our, you know, our higher priorities in any given context. Um, and finally, you know, the diversity in our needs can make it difficult to use standardized tools to get this work done. Um, so I think here what we want to do is show an example of some of how that uh, the assumptions that one might make about technology and platforms kind of play into our challenges tracking and using work, uh, doing work in ways that I think are considered pretty standard across various offices. So we're going to turn it over to Derek for a minute. And Derek, we have a description on the slide um, that uh, has your analogy about uh, that you're going to discuss uh, the bookshelf analogy that you that you had come up with to, to kind of describe your experience. Okay, great. Um, so part of this is um, being pulled into uh, what people ordinarily experience. And the idea being that when you, let me give you an example. When you um, create a dish of spaghetti and you sit down to eat, or let's say it's an omelet, right? You sit down, you're eating the omelet. You're not really thinking about the hands that prepared it, all of the steps and the sequences that went into creating this thing, this, this outcome. And somewhat, uh, it's somewhat the, with this, the same with, um, with documents. 
Uh, when I enter into a document, I don't know what its dimensions are. I don't know what the data is. I don't know how the data is being held or anything like that. So part of it is always an exploration of finding out, okay, what kind of puzzle is, is this? Now, most people live in a world of gloss in which they don't really pay attention to those lot of minor details, you know, the work that goes in, the actual practical tasks that go into how you assess a document, how you orient yourself to a document, how you interface with it. Um, but blindness has a way of pulling people into that um, into that world of details in a way that most sighted people don't really recognize and see. Um, it, what it can do it, when it comes down to looking at something with the screen reader is show you the actual minor steps, the minor tasks, the minor decisions that have to be made in order to make sense of what you're interfacing with, what you're seeing when you open this document. So that's a presentation to this video clip. Great. Okay. And we'll go ahead and play the video. So before we press play, this is an, uh, this is, uh, a brief just recorded moment of somebody on our team, Derek, who's blind, interacting with a document that's unfamiliar with the screen reader. Okay, so we just yeah. opened this Google Sheet to find out what information is contained in it. Uh, part of the challenge is identifying what is the data that we're looking for. So the first thing that I'm going to do is try to figure out what cell I'm in. Recommendation category A1. Recommendation left current S, right current B1. Okay, so that tells me that I'm in category, category A1. No more cells. I'm very at the very, very top of the of the document. And if I do a right arrow, recommendation left current S, right current B1. It says recommendation. Data sign C1. Tells me data signed. S on you left current S, right current B1. Milestone left current S, right current B1. So this sounds like these are um, these are uh, rows, row variables. And each row variable okay. has information um, in it that is going to be collected in the left current y slash and right current g1. So let's go back and see if there's milestone left current s right current e1. No more cells, no more cells. Mm -hmm. Recommendation left current s right current e1. Ensure that all printed publications inform readers that the publications are available in alternative formats upon request. B2 website frozen rows. Okay, so what I did was I went to recommendation left current s right current recommendation. Zoom. I used a down arrow. Ensure that all printed publications indicated okay, this is a column. It confirms that it's a column and that there's data in there. Let's see if there's something below that. Ensure that all printed publications and notices follow the university style guide left current link here colon h p p s colon slash slash brand dot edu slash style dash guide slash make it a practice to review all publications and notices. That's a third data point. So now what this is telling me is that there's rows and columns. We've got rows at the top which go across that are um, identifying uh, variables. And then you've got um, tasks, so to speak, that you're measuring to determine if they're able to be completed along the uh, along the rows. All right. So ensure that all printed publications and notices follow. So ensure that all printed publications. Task. Recommendation left current as right current B1. Ensure that all printed C2. Okay, so C2. Ensure that all printed publications. Inform reader that the publications are available in alternate. It's ensure that the publications are in an alternate format. C2. C2. Then I have to go up arrow to figure out what's this column. Data sign C1 inside frozen rows. C2 outside frozen rows. What date is this task going to be assigned to a person? So it's not that this is not functionally accessible. It's totally accessible in this way because I can figure out basically it's a it's a simple pattern where you've got row variables and then you've got, I mean, you've got column variables and you've got row variables. And so this is relatively simple to navigate. Now, obviously it gets a little bit complex when you get into the 15th row and the 14th column, but you can use freeze panes in Google Sheets like you can in Excel that will help you do that. Now another um, why don't you why don't you actually show us navigating down to like row you know 15 or whatever just to give a sense of what that looks like. Oh okay cool so in publications and written materials A3 publications and written materials A4 publications let's and go down to maybe A15 publications and written materials A6 telephone information technology A14 accessible print and public information A15 accessible print and public information A16 accessible print and accessible print and public information A17 Okay, so accessible press and public information A17. Ensure LDs are available for hard of hearing attendees of public information sessions. B17. C17. D17. B17. Okay, so I know the 17 is going to tell me that's the row that I'm on. This accessible press, press and public information A17. Press and public information. Ensure LDs are available for hard of hearing. C17. Again, how do I know what the B17. B17. I can use the command to freeze the columns, and then I can have the command. I can, I can use a command to freeze the column and the rows. Um, Great. So I think that was just our attempt to show kind of what standardized tools look like for a team that has a truly diverse set of functional needs. Hold, um, excuse me, Ben. Please, uh, yeah. None of the people online could hear yeah, anything, from that, unfortunately. So you might, oh, okay. you might need to give a little synopsis of what.
that was about? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, for those of you who couldn't hear the audio and our apologies for that, um, what the screen reader does is it very faithfully tell you a couple of pieces of information, what column you're in, what row you're in, and the contents of any given cell. Now, a sighted person can really easily refer to the column headers to tell you what, you know, what is supposed to exist in that cell or what data it you know, is implied that should be there. Um, but if you're using a screen reader, you're constantly having to refer back to the column header while kind of maintaining a mental map of where all of the data should exist and what types of data belong in each space. Um, so in this way, um, the kind of process of interacting with an unfamiliar document is like trying to build out a library catalog while sifting through books, um, while you're unable to actually look at the bookshelf itself. Yeah. Um, Derek, anything else you want to add, Derek? No, that was great. Um, and, and that's the idea is that um, you don't know, you know that there's data in this file, but you don't know what configuration it takes. There's an assumption of what it's supposed to look like so that when you walk into, when you go into the file and you find that it's not that way, now comes the puzzle solving opportunity. What kind of puzzle is this? What information goes on what bookcase? Is there a shelf here? That kind of a thing. So part of it is just this exploration of examining what is this document and how do I make sense of it? Great. And uh, I think um, I've recently heard about a, about a theory um, that I wanted to share, which is the spoon theory. How many people already know about the spoon theory? Okay, great. <laughs> so the spoon theory is the idea that in any given day, you have a, a finite number of spoons. So let's say that you have 10 spoons and each individual um, activity uh, exerts a certain amount of, uh, you know, takes a certain number of spoons. So for one person, the activity could take two spoons. For another person, it could take four spoons. And so the, um, so part of what we really wanted to do with kind of uh, streamlining our, uh, the tools that we would use for program management is to really find that balance between, okay, well, if a document is uh, technically and functionally accessible, is it still usable? And so for certain documents that are really long or don't, you know, or, you know, there's a hundred rows and you lose what the title of the row was supposed to describe, you know, that that's not really usable at that point. And so, um, for example, uh, Derek has a, an assistant with a certain number of hours. And so instead of using six spoons, then he can, you know, use two spoons and the assistant will use an additional spoon, for example. So I think that that's, um, and I can explain more if you, if you have any questions or any confusion around that, but that's kind of the, the general gist. Great. Let's go on. So given this, this, uh, you know, huge kind of upfront challenge on our team, uh, for our team. Um, great. Um, we've tried a lot of different methods to track mm. our projects and our work across the, across the group. Um, we've tried every form of Google Sheet. Uh, we've tried every form of Google Form you could imagine. We've tried, uh, you know, check-in meetings, um, um, team meetings, uh, you know, all of the kind of traditional methods. We've tried project management platforms Asana, uh, case management platforms uh, for more traditional case management, like kind of social work type platforms. Uh, we've tried drag. We've, we've tried everything that you can think of. Um, and I think the really important thing that we discovered through all of this is a couple of pieces. One, our team might present a more extreme version of the challenge that every team faces in trying to figure out what tools are going to work and how much energy you want to spend using a tool and conforming your work to a tool versus getting work done. Um, because we all know, I think that both of those are really critical things. You have to advance the work, but you also need to make sure you understand and can tell the story about what work you've done. Um, and the way that I like to think about it, uh, at least lots of our previous attempts at project management and tracking is that we created various buckets. It's great when you have everything in a bucket. You have a bucket, the bucket is full. Um, but that doesn't actually make the bucket a useful way of interacting with or managing your projects. You just 
have a bucket now. Um, and so that is kind of, that was our experience, I think, across, across multiple attempts. Um, so again, you know, our processes, our methods, and our outputs differ greatly between our team members. And that means taking multiple flexible approaches to how we're getting information into any system that we're using to manage our projects, um, um, while also being sensitive to the need to have a coherent place. Um, and so one thing that I think we really want to focus on is how our office defines success. And I think that this process of kind of going through the creative uh, and strategic planning effort to have a clear mission, vision, and values lets you understand for your for your individual team project or work group, you know what it means to be successful, so that you can understand what you're tracking and why. I think we found um, really frequently, especially in our early conversations around this, there were lots of variables and metrics that we thought we needed to track that really at the end of the day, wouldn't provide any value for what we were proposing. So things like the volume of emails we each receive, uh, you know, in a month, um, or even the number of meetings specifically that we're holding, or even the number of consultations, some of these things, because of the varying outputs of the team, wouldn't line up well across team members, and then also didn't add any value to, in terms of helping us understand what we were doing. I think um, a common phenomenon across lots of teams is the feeling of being completely overwhelmed by the volume of work that you're trying to manage and not really understanding why that overwhelm exists. Yeah, and I think that um, because we work in such kind of diverse areas of accessibility and um, compliance that oftentimes even, you know, our coworkers can sometimes forget the work that we do. <laughs> and so, you know, there's also a, a part of it where we don't want to replicate the, um, the, the job duties of any one person as well and be able to kind of collaborate with one another to learn about the processes that, um, and the duties of each individual uh, staff member. So um, on the slide right now, for those of you who uh, can't see it, it says, how do we define, how we define success? And so just to, to read the mission of the Disability Access and Compliance Office. So our mission is DSE upholds the civil rights of disabled people and the mission of the university by ensuring an accessible campus. Our vision is that DAC is a model of excellence leading the University of California towards a universally accessible future. And what our values, and I'll just read the highlights here, are accessibility, advocacy, equity and inclusion and integrity in the work that we do and in our work with others. And uh, we just also want to give a big plug to <clears throat> the HR um, office. Uh, and this is something that any department um, in the UC system can do where you can actually uh, uh, be able to obtain consultations with an HR person to do a strategic plan and to kind of really think over kind of has the mission of your department changed? Has its, um, you know, any of its moving parts has changed? Any new positions that have been added on that needs clarity? <clears throat> and for us, it was really helpful because we're actually a fairly new office at UC Berkeley. I think that we're- 2018. 2018 is when we started. And so, you know, half of the time that we existed as an office was during the pandemic. So that, you know, this also necessitated the um, having remote work um, be really impactful in the normal day-to-day -day work that we do. Great. And so kind of where did we end up landing after all of this? Um, so I think the first and most important thing is that we want to recognize that what we're doing now is a work in progress. And I think that the flexibility that we're trying to uphold in our team and in our work means that the systems that we're using are never going to be completely finalized. We have to, based on what we do, adapt. Some teams in other contexts might not need to adapt quite so consistently or so flexibly, but I think it is still a really integral part of understanding what we're doing and how we're doing that we're prepared to adapt our kind of project management methods to meet the current goals. Um, so, for example, right now we're uh, utilizing Smartsheets to kind of create an overview um, dashboard of each of 
our individual projects and our work streams, and that um, we each have our individual dashboard where that we can edit and add new projects um, or new responsibilities. And then our executive director, Ella Cowell, will actually have access to all of our dashboards so she can have an overview of any projects that we're working on currently and any up, uh, upcoming deadlines. And then we also have kind of the status of the project. And so, you know, if a project is falling behind or if it's put on hold, then we can kind of discuss why that is and if there's anything that we can do or if it's just that other priorities have to be taken up at that at that time. And so that's why certain projects have to be put on hold. But I think it's uh, one of the things that we've discovered is that one source, so one tool didn't work for our team. So in addition to using Smartsheets, I think you know everybody on our team has kind of come up with their individual way of feeding information into a Smartsheet so that our executive director has that high level overview while we still maintain individual systems. So um, for me, for example, that is a lot of uh, you know, regular Google Forms. As somebody who's cited, I need to be able to take quick snapshots of where multiple construction projects are across you know, a couple million dollars of construction happening over 12 months. Um, or the current, you know, the current status of a master planning effort um, with a 18 month project horizon. Whereas other people are using you know, Word documents that work better for their access and functional needs um, or other databases and systems that touch on other places in the campus. And the goal is always to feed relevant information into the tracking system that provides our executive leadership with the high level overview that they need in order to understand what we're doing, but not forcing everybody to use the same tool in the same way. Yeah, and so for example, I have a, a docket of, of um, accessibility issues that have come up on campus. And so um, Smartsheets has an option where you can attach documents. I mean, you can certainly add a link into your description, but um, this way, you know, you can have access to that document and your um, you know, high level leadership can have access to that document as well. And for some people on their dashboard, they put, you know, regular meeting notes um, as attachments that they can just quickly click on when they have a, re a regular meeting, like with a staff member or, you know, with another department that you're meeting on a biweekly or a monthly basis. And so it's just one way that you can kind of organize, um, which is why we kind of went with this tool as kind of a, um, a main tracking device for main tracking device, main tra tracking system um, to kind of have a, a a big overview of what we do as a unit. No, we, we do not install tracking devices on our staff, but we do utilize tracking systems. Um, but I think the important- Again, trust. And trust, right, trust. <laughs> trust, but verify? Huh. Um, um, but I think, uh, you know, the, the important thing with the dashboards is that everybody's dashboard is unique. And so while the ultimate information feeds up to a high level overview, the actual setup even of the way that I interact with my dashboard is different than other members on my team. Um, so that's, um, so that's our presentation. Um, thanks for, so much for joining us. If there's any questions in the audience or online, um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. I just had a quick question. Um, so you'd say that uh, everybody has to input the data differently into Smartsheet, into their thing. Do you have people that you work with that help them integrate that data or is it like a lot of manual input individually across the board? Yeah, so I mean, we wanted to have the individual dashboards and the um, dashboards that uh, high level leadership has access to to be kind of really simplified. And so we are only including kind of our high level projects that are we working on, you know, not the kind of day to day uh, tasks that we have to do for that project or for that work stream. And so, you know, honestly, on that dashboard, there can just be five things that we list on there because they're just, you know, five large buckets of, of work that we do. And then from there, then each person can customize the attachments that they want to put on there or um, any other, uh, you know, documents that they're working on. So I think 
the actual the, the challenge for us was really defining what belongs in a dashboard and what is work <clears> that <throat> is, is kind of work outside of that high level tracking, right? Um, and it was it's surprisingly unintuitive. Um, um, you know, deciding well, this is this is an ad hoc request that we're going to address, you know, within a couple of days. Um, some advice that we received uh, that I think is really helpful is actually for your team establishing a number of hours of expected work on a specific task that limits it to be considered something ad hoc, like a piece of work discrete from a project that goes into a project tracking system, and having that clear definition of it, you know, whether it's a 40 hours total or whatever it is for your team, that really helped us because we are such a small group, a total of six folks, that we do have to do a lot of the input ourselves. Yeah. If you, um, if it matters, if you're able to crack the net of um, resource allocation, oh my goodness, the microphone's cutting it. Resource <laughs> yeah. allocation, bandwidth planning, sort of thing, planning six months out for, hey, you know, do you have capacity for different things? That is that's always a working progress. Um, I think that that's probably that's partly why we really wanted to take a step back and do a strategic plan. You know, we I think we we did have kind of like a DAC at five years um, kind of vision um, and then to kind of backtrack and uh, not backtrack, but kind of take a step back and and uh, and work with uh, you know an external party um, such as the HR department, who um, I think Ben can probably give you the name of the person that we uh, met with uh, at Berkeley. But that really helps to find what our goals were, and then what you know what the our immediate projects were, and then you know six months out, where do we want to be? A year out, where we want to be? And so I think that um, really what we learned is that please utilize the resources that you have on each individual campus um, because just because you know your work doesn't mean that um, you you know you can't take a step back and and really be able to gain clarity um, as a unit what your mission is and kind of what flows from that but i think as far as um, is this mic still working or is it now let me no because I'm just gonna move over here. We're fine. I'm just gonna I'll speak into uh, speaking into this mic. So hopefully that's a little better. Yeah, that um, is better. Great. Um the the other part of it was actually really defining for our office and for each individual what we don't do. Um and so part of the visioning and, and strategic planning effort that was really important was to look at the roles inside of the office and make sure that we understand what we can reasonably what we can reasonably say no to with a small team with lots of high level officers working in in a lot of ways pretty unrelated areas it's very easy for any one of us to say ah sure i'll pick that up it's not it seems you know job adjacent <laughs> um and and that mission creep was really posing challenges for our capacity to focus on and allocate resources appropriately to those core projects the other important thing about having these this kind of high level project tracking dashboard is that, for example, I can look at my project portfolio and say, you know, I'm running two multi year campus wide surveys. I've got, you know, 10 or 15 things in construction. I'm sitting on seven committees. Um, no, no more. Um, and and that. Um, so I think that's kind of that was the critical piece for us is understanding what we don't do as individuals and as an office. Two questions. Um, you with other Okay. How if projects other than construction you know if, if the IT implementations for example smart screen yeah um yeah I'll take I'll take the second one first so 
I think that that is when we talk about kind of the flexibility. So the the question was um, that you. I'm answering is, uh, what concerns have come up with things uh, with with uh, yeah with Smartsheets specifically when it comes to ex digital accessibility? And I I think this is when the spoon analogy is really important for us. Um, we Smartsheets can be an accessible platform. Um, user decisions about how it's how it's implemented define the actual accessibility of a platform like Smartsheets. Mm -hmm. And so it's a combination of making decisions for our team about how we use it, maybe not using bleeding edge features that have maybe kind of paltry implementation of accessibility, but focusing on the things that are core to what we need to get done in order to make sure that it is that that it works. Um, and then if it's not the best, if it's not the best use of an individual team member's time to, to understand all of the ways that they need to interact with that product, figuring out a workaround so we can still proceed. That person isn't using all of their energy in that way. Um, and that we still get what we need out of the, the system overall. Okay. So it sounds uh, like you're using smart sheets in an operational way rather than just a status reporting way in some, in some cases. That, okay. is, that is correct. It's, right. It's an operational tool for us. Perfect. Yeah. It's okay. more of an overview. So it, you know, we were thinking of a tool that, um, doesn't take a lot of training in order to interact with. And so, for example, that's why we uh, did away with any sort of, you know, project management platform, um, because there's a training component to it and each individual is going to need, you know, varying amount, varying amount of time in order to learn that material. And so that was partly why we went with Smartsheets, where it's something that you can kind of pick up pretty quickly and, um, and again, like Ben said, we didn't need to, you know, utilize the, the unicorn option or the, you know, any fancy sort of tools we were, this was mainly just kind of a, a quick overview of, of all the projects that are going on in the unit. How have you worked with either other campus units or, um, you know, other UCs on best practices for uh, sure. So, you know, for example, uh, part of the digital accessibility the program. Oh, uh, repeat the question, please. Yeah. So, was, how have you worked with other campus units um, on best practices around tracking, reporting um, work that we're doing? Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I think part of it is the nature of the work that we do. And so, for example, where each of us are on varying committees and, for example, with the digital accessibility program, um, I work with our executive director on creating, um, you know, the implementation process of uh, of a UC wide policy such as digital accessibility. And so we work with other departments um, in on campus, such as the library, um, RTL, uh, as a working group in order to kind of create a, create the procedures that are best practices for our campus. Um, and at the same time, we also have committees where it's on a UC-wide um, uh, basis. So for example, I'm part of the um, electronic uh, accessibility committee that's um, under UCOP. And so we meet every month um, and there are representatives from each UC. And so then we have agendas and best practices that we come up with um, that we then bring to our individual campuses. Um, and just to add, apparently my lapel mic is working again. So, um, and, and just to add, you know, um, one thing that I try in my work, for example, I try not to do is reproduce a tracking tool that another office is already using. So because we've got, you know, again, it's it's high level. You know, our, our team has got a bunch of high level officers with no support staff. Um, and so I, you know, I execute a lot of my work through our capital projects, capital strategies and facility services offices. And by the nature of what they're doing, they have to track a lot of this stuff already. So I try really hard 
to rely on their tracking methods and systems, except for how, except for when I need to translate that information up to my chain of command. Um, and so what that means is uh, you know, reproducing the bare minimum amount of it, it where possible and only when needed, and then tying things together if I can. I'm not super fancy. I don't, I'm not using API calls or any, I'm not pushing or pulling directly from those other data sources, at least not frequently. Um, but it does mean running reports and attaching them so that I can make sure that it's cutting out again. So that I can make sure that what I'm doing is well represented and what they're doing is translating in, into the work that's happening on our end as well. But but I think the the critical thing is not rep, not reproducing it. Um, also, we've got about two minutes left. So if there's one, any maybe one more question. But if not, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you.